<sighs> I'm so tired today. None of the kids slept last night, so um, I've been up since three. I didn't even know there was a three in the morning. It's been so long since I've last seen three in the morning. But there is, and it sucks. So, you'll have to excuse me if I uh, drift off midway through a chapter, or if I fall off my chair, or if I zone out. But we I hope you're all all right. I have tea, so, you know. I'm awake! Oh, I'm so tired. Um, okay, um... Alex is still undergoing his uh, transformation at the hands of the warden. Uh, he's had his legs turned into these great big muscly slabs of muscle. Uh, he's had his eyes turned into these silver eyes that can see in the dark. And he's gradually losing his mind to the warden's schemes. Um, fortunately for him... Gary Owens, the horrible leader of the Skulls, is also in the infirmary, and he is almost completely a monster now. He's not a black suit, he's just a, 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 a creature. And he burst free of his chains in the infirmary and scared Alex so much that he remembered about Gary, and he remembered about his himself as well, and he remembered his name. So he's, he's hanging on in there. He's hanging on. He's, he's remembering bits. Uh, but the warden has just sent it back to the screening room where he has to view horrible images of death and decay and destruction um, to try and strip his mind clean. Okay. I don't know if I mentioned it, but I'm so tired. <clears throat> Arms. My head was a war zone. Memories of an old life that I had almost forgotten, battling with the fantasies of power that had threatened to consume me. I fought to make sense of things, but the confusion was too great, a seething mass of images and thoughts that threatened to drive me insane. My name is Alex, I told myself, as one black suit retrieved my gurney and another lifted me onto it. Even as the words spewed from my lips, they made no sense, sounding to my ears like a foreign language. But I knew that I had to keep saying them. Uh, my name is Alex. My name is Alex. My name is Alex. My name is... A gloved hand clamped down on my mouth, so hard that I struggled to breathe. I flailed against it as the guards wheeled me back across the infirmary, but the grip was too powerful. One more word from you, and we'll be seeing just how long you last against the shotgun, said one of the suits, ducking beneath the plastic strips that led out towards surgery. You've got some nasty little memories in there that just won't go away. Well, they better do so soon or you'll end up in there. He gestured towards a steel door at the end of the corridor, and I remembered a room full of bodies and a raging fire. I ignored his warning. I tried to speak, but he pressed his hand down until I felt my teeth cut through the back of my lips. That's what happens to the one who's, who can't forget, the black suit continued through his shark's grin. We burn them along with the other trash. I could feel the sting of flames on my flesh, the memory of pain just enough to keep my mouth shut. We swung right at the junction, rattling along the uneven floor until we reached another door. It opened into the same room I'd been locked in before, the one with the screen, and although I panicked at the thought of having my eyes pinned open again, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was powerless to stop the suits as they strapped me into the chair. If you have to keep one thing in that head of yours, then let it be this growled the giant man as he lifted my eyelid. You're either one of us or one of them, and believe me, you don't want to make the wrong decision. He stood aside to let a wheezer in, and I felt the sting of the needle once again. This time, the nectar poured into me like I was hollow, filling me from toe to forehead with its clawing darkness. My mouth drooped open, a weak cry like that of a dying bird, the only protest I could make as the freaks left the room. Before I arrived in Furnace, I never could have imagined that there would be so much horror in the world. 
But here it was, carried from celluloid to screen by flickering light, seemingly every act of senseless violence ever to be committed. It was a different film from the last one. No animals this time, just humans. But the things they did to one another were crimes that not even the lowest beast would inflict upon its enemies. Again, I tried to close my eyes. I tried to look away, to think about something other than the nightmare unfolding in front of me. But I couldn't shut my burning eyelids. I couldn't move my head. And when your worst fears are paraded endlessly before you, how can you force your mind away? I don't know how long I was in there before the images started to seep from the screen, suspended in the air as though I was wearing 3D glasses. It was like the madness of what I was seeing was too much to be contained, like it overflowed its origins and polluted everything around it. I knew I was hallucinating, that the nectar was making me see things that weren't there, but as the punches flew, the guns fired and the bodies fell all around me, it was as if I was standing in a hurricane of bloodshed and cruelty, one that battered and blasted against my mind. And it wasn't long before my mental defences were stripped away completely. One by one, the clips of film tore through the air and into my head, pushing out all other thoughts. I fought to hold on to my name, to the memories that had returned when I'd seen Gary and what he'd become. But the nectar was a black tar pasted over my old life, onto which the images on screen stuck like feathers. No scrap of memory was spared. Everywhere I looked, I saw only aggression, only anger, only death. And if there is nothing left of you but darkness, how can you not become a monster? (coughs) When you're seeing things that aren't there, there is no line between being awake and being asleep. I looked down, saw that the leather straps were now loose, and I knew I must be dreaming. My suspicions were confirmed when I stumbled to the door and opened it up onto Armageddon. At first I thought I was outside, but before the elation could rise higher than my stomach, I knew it was an illusion. Ahead of me, stretching to a horizon lost in darkness, was a muddy field. Above it, where the sky should have been, roiled a ceiling of crimson smoke, so thick it could have been made of rock. The wet earth was littered with forms that might once have been human, like a graveyard where the dead have floated to the surface. Scattered at uneven intervals were huge craters, some half filled with water like stagnant ponds. Even as I watched, something fell from the heaving sky, exploding into a ball of burning colour as it struck the earth. Dark water fell, carrying with it a heavy hail of rock and bone. By the time the light from the fireball had sputtered out, I saw the shapes in the mud start to move. They were crawling forward in slow motion. Past the filth that covered them head to toe, I made out uniforms of worn cloth, round metal helmets and belts laden with equipment. Each of the writhing forms gripped a rifle in one bony hand, holding it up towards the distant horizon, towards a hidden enemy. Another explosion rocked the earth a stone's throw away, pumping more smoke into the glowering sky. Silhouetted against the flames were three figures who marched across the mud without missing a single step. Each was dressed in a leather trench coat, a gas mask strapped to his face. Two held a stretcher between them, the third scanned the ground with beady eyes, like a vulture looking for flesh. They stopped by a shape in the dirt, close enough for me to see a boy there. His uniform was in tatters, mud disguising the wounds that had been opened up beneath. He looked up at the stretcher, and I thought he would be relieved to see it, happy at the thought of leaving this carnage. But when he saw the men who carried it, their wheezes audible even over the distant sound of gunfire and the patter of falling shrapnel, he began to scream. I'm not injured, I can fight, came his voice, and even though I didn't understand his language, I knew what he said. The men didn't reply. They simply laid the stretcher on the ground and started to peel the boy from his casket of wet earth. He fought, yet despite his claims, he was too weak to stop them. Seconds later, he was strapped in place and the men in gas masks were carrying him into the darkness. I watched them go, saw the red bands strapped to their arms, the swastikas blazoned there. And then they were gone. The boy's shrieks, the last thing to fade as he was carried off, taken to somewhere far worse 
than this landscape of madness and mud. I don't remember leaving the screening room, although I must have done so, because the next time I woke I could feel the same pain in my arms as I had in my legs. I looked past my shoulders to see two slabs of meat, so immense that the bloody bandages wrapped around them were threatening to split. I flexed my new muscles, enjoying the strength I could feel there behind the pain. These weren't the sort of limbs used to cover your face as you curled into a ball, bleating. They were the limbs of someone who struck fear into his enemies, the arms of a survivor, a killer. Blinking out the haze of sleep, I swung my head around to see that I was back in my cubicle in the infirmary. Instead of a bed, however, I was lying almost upright inside a metal coffin tipped back against the wall. Welded into the dark steel were thick chains which secured my arms, legs and chest. I knew without even trying that I wouldn't stand a chance of breaking out of them, despite my new strength. Something about the sarcophagus rang a distant bell in my memory, but the poison, still dripping into my veins from the IV bags beside me, was plastered over every thought, and the nagging doubt soon popped like a bubble in tar. I tried thinking back to my dream, back to anything that had happened before I woke, but the same impenetrable darkness covered it all. It isn't taking. The voice was faint but close, maybe from the next compartment over. I let my head swing to the side, tried to make out the whispered words. Double his feed, and if nothing happens, send him to the incinerator. I'm not willing to waste any more nectar on a lost cause. <laughs> There was a muffled response, but even if I had been able to make out a word, it was masked by a wheeze. I heard a curtain open and close, followed by footsteps. Then the white wall in front of me peeled apart to reveal the warden's face. For a second, I caught his eye, and suddenly I was back in the screening room. A sickly procession of morbid images splashed across my retinas. I looked away, and the world reasserted itself. You're awake! he said, pushing into the compartment. I didn't look up to see if he was smiling or not, and he made no effort to approach. For a while there, I wasn't sure you'd make it. They filled you with more nectar than I thought was possible. I wonder, do you know who you are? I pushed into the shadows of my mind, looking for a response. But the truth was the warden's question didn't make any sense. I was me, and I was being made better, and that's all there ever had been. I shook my head, each movement slow and exaggerated. What about a name? the warden asked. Do you have one? Again, I fought the confusion, trying to understand what he might mean. I knew what a name was, of course, but as for mine, surely I'd never needed one because I've just been born. And in this world, where force was everything, what good was a name? Why did you need a word to identify you when you could define yourself with strength? I shook my head once more. Good, good, the warden said. You got there in the end. It's a positive sign. The ones who fight the most take more work. But when you fall, you fall hard. How are your arms? They hurt, I wanted to say, although my mouth refused to shape the words and instead they spilled out as one long, low groan. They look strong, the warden went on. They're healing already. You know, an operation like that would kill the healthiest adult, even if he was an athlete or a soldier, even if he had been pumped full of nectar. Human genetics truly is a miracle, if you could only see what you were becoming. I knew what I was becoming. Stronger, faster, better. I didn't need to see it when I could feel it in every fibre, in every burning nerve. One more procedure, came the voice, all smoke and steel. The most difficult, but the most rewarding. One more operation, and the transformation will be complete. Then we'll give you a little test to see how far you've come. I watched his legs turn and move towards the curtain, but he paused before leaving. And to make sure there's no going back. Intruders. I waited for that final procedure with murder on my mind.
Strapped upright in my metal coffin, the screams and wheezes of the infirmary around me, I could only think about breaking free of my chains and unleashing my newfound strength. Nobody would be safe. Because I was the predator, <clears throat> they were my prey. Blood would spill and it would not be mine. Whenever I had the energy, I would test my muscles, feeling the power that lay in the swollen flesh. I didn't know what they'd done to me, whether it was my own body they had grown, sprouting coiled tendons of steel under the skin, or whether somebody else's tissue had been grafted to mine. It didn't matter. All I knew was that now I possessed a raw might that could tear the world to pieces if it wanted. A picture floated into my head of a boy, the same boy I sometimes saw in my dreams. He was pale, his arms and legs like twigs, his ribs showing even through his prison overalls. A distant part of me, buried deep beneath a lake of poison, knew that somehow I had once been this boy. But the only emotion this knowledge produced was nausea. How could I ever let myself be so weak, so pathetic? The scrawny ghost that pleaded silently in my head was not fit for life. He didn't deserve it. That's why he had died, so that I could be born. The child was gone. His name was gone. All that existed was me, the beast that had grown from his corpse. I let the growled laughter come, hearing the deep pulses reverberate from the stone like thunder. Nobody would ever disrespect me again. Nobody would ever bully me or lift a finger against me. Distant words distracted me from my fantasies and I let my heavy head swing around. Sobs and choked cries were heard frequently in the infirmary, but words were rare. Especially hissed, urgent commands like these. I listened out for the clack of the warden's shoes, the breath of a wheezer, but other than the wave-like symphony of whispers rising and falling, there was nothing. Hurry, I made out, the sound of metal scraping against metal. Come on, cut the other one. There was a scuffling sound, the slap of leather on stone, then the patter of footsteps. I felt my heartbeat quicken, the nectar coming to life in my veins. I gripped the chains that held me, tried to force them from their steel casings. I didn't know what was going on out there. All I knew was that I wanted to be part of it. The metal squealed in protest, but held tight. Where are the others? One of the voices said. There's no time. Just find them. More footsteps over panicked breaths. Then the sound of curtains being pulled back. The noises grew closer until it seemed as though they were right next door. Are you OK? Quick, cut the straps. A slurred response, followed by the grating of a serrated blade through leather. I heard more words that I couldn't make out. Then something pale and wraith-like pushed its way past the scream to the side of me. I snapped my head around and opened my mouth, letting loose a guttural growl that sent the face skittering back into the next compartment. Seconds later it returned, and there were two more with it. I knew them, although at the same time they were complete strangers. The first was half boy and half beast, one arm grotesquely muscled, the same way that both of mine were. His silver eyes were wide in disbelief, and he shook his head as though I was a nightmare that had visited him in the flesh. The two kids standing next to him were tiny by comparison, and they looked unmarked. Jesus, said one, smoothing a hand through his hair. He had turned three shades paler in the time he'd been standing there. We've got to go, said the smallest kid. Weezers will be back any minute. Is that him, said the freak with the giant arm. The other kid walked forward and I wrenched at my chains again, growling at him. He had no right to look at me the way he was doing now, as if I deserved pity. He was the weak one. They all were. Weak and incomplete. If I could escape, I'd show them what strength was. I'd show them power. All three seemed to recoil at the sound of my growl, but they didn't leave. Simon, what do we do? said the youngest. Can we get him out? No, answered the bigger kid. He's too far gone. Look at him, for Christ's sake. I've never seen that much nectar hooked up into the vein. We can't leave him, said the third boy. I studied his face and was surprised to see that every trace of weakness had gone. His expression was set in stone, a look of fierce determination, and it sent chills down my spine. I knew that look. I knew it because I'd worn it once. A memory swam through the nectar like a whale trying to breach the surface of a frozen sea. 
I couldn't grasp it. But I knew that I'd been in this situation before, only, only it had been different. The kid vanished into the next cubicle and returned a second later with something in his hands. I couldn't quite twist my head around far enough to see what it was, but somehow I knew. It was a pillow. What are you doing? said the small kid. You're not going to... Ozzy, shut up! snapped the one they called Simon. It's the only thing we can do. He's gone! The boy with the pillow took a step forward and I felt the terror wash through me. I thrashed against my chains, but they were solid steel fingers that held me tight. Opening my mouth, I screamed at him, the sound like the roar of a jet engine. But he didn't stop. He didn't take his eyes from mine. Alex, are you in there? he said. Because if you are, then you have to let me know. Right now. I growled again, throwing my entire body at him in the hope that my bonds would snap. There was nothing called Alex here. There was just me, and I was going to kill the child in front of me. I was going to kill them all. I was the powerful one, the predator. They were nothing but loose skin on bone, not even worthy of being prey. I felt my face split open at the thought, my grin like the sneer of a lion that knows it is about to feast. Jesus, see, hurry up, I can hear them coming. See, I knew the word, the name, although I couldn't think from where. It floated before me like silk in water, surrounded by thoughts and images I could make no sense of. I had almost grasped one, uh, the kid called Z in an elevator, alongside me and two others being carried down into the guts of the earth. But by the time it had taken shape, I felt the pillow on my face. I almost laughed at the thought that I could be killed by such a pathetic weapon. Then I tried to draw breath, and my lungs stayed empty. I bucked, snapping my head back and forth, but the kid must have had all his weight on my face because the pillow didn't shift. I'm sorry, I heard him say. Forgive me, Alex. I struggled to draw breath, feeling the panic radiate from my starved lungs. All the pillow gave me was dust and the stench of sickness. If I could just get an arm free, then I'd stand a chance. I could kill him before he killed me. Oh God, they're here, said one of the others, his words accompanied by a familiar wheeze that swept in from the back of the infirmary. I tried to scream again, to draw the gas mask's attention, but with nothing behind it, my cry was silent. I felt the pillow press with greater insistency, heard the boys argue amongst themselves as the dry wheezes grew closer. Even with the cloth against my face, I could feel the edges of my vision growing dark, the sounds fading like I had cotton wool in my ears. It's too late! The voice pushed through the numbness in my brain, and all of a sudden the darkness was ripped away. I found myself staring into the twisted face of a weezer. One of its gnarled hands was wrapped around Simon's throat, and the other held the scruff of Z's neck. The smallest kid was curled up in a ball on the floor, screaming the same three words over and over. It's too late! It's too late! It's too late! And it was. Even as the boys fought to free themselves, the black suits ran into the infirmary, fierce silver eyes aiming down their shotgun barrels. They flew into the cubicle like a dark tornado, the butts of their guns causing the boys to fall like pins. It was over before I could draw in my first stuttered breath. Get them back to their beds, a black suit said, wiping the mess from his gun before using it to point to Simon and Z. Before anyone could move, the sound of the warden's shoes drifted up from the back of the room. The black suits straightened, their faces steeled against the storm that was coming. What now? came his voice. He appeared at the open curtains of my cubicle, and I turned away before I could meet his eye. Is a little order around here too much to ask for? Go on, get them back before the feed is damaged, and that kid find out how he got in and if there are any more of them out there. When I asked for the perimeter to be secured, I meant just that. I felt his glare scuttling up from Ozzy to me like a spider. What about number 208? he asked, his voice directed at me. I think they were trying to kill him, replied one of the black suits. Same way they killed number 191. Any damage? This time it was a weezer that responded, although there were no words in its gargled purr. 
The warden stepped forward. Find out if there's brain damage. I don't know how long he went without oxygen. He looks weaker than he did. My fury had lifted up my head before I even knew what I was doing. Weaker? Even the warden had no right to call me that. I met his eyes, felt the world peeling away like wallpaper, felt the cold touch of death in the swollen pits of his pupils. But I didn't look away. I held it until it felt as though my soul had been pulled out of me and the devil's breath had taken its place. Only then, when every last drop of strength had been drained, did I let my head drop. Well, I take it back, he said. Not weaker at all, just angrier. Good, good. You will soon have a chance to get even. I heard him stand to one side while the black suits hauled their catch from the floor. Even though I didn't have the energy to move, I caught a glimpse of the kid called Ozzy as he was dragged away. His eyes were distant and unfocused, his mouth silently shaping those same three words. Then a giant hand engulfed his head and he was lifted out of my line of sight. Once you're done interrogating the intruder, take him to the chamber. The warden's voice grew fainter as he walked away, but I could still make out what he was saying. As soon as number 208 has had his final procedure, we can try him out on the child. See just how powerful that anger makes him. There was more, but it came from too far away. It didn't matter. I understood what the warden had said. One more procedure and I'd be let loose. I'd be free. And nothing would stop me tearing the life from those who had tried to kill me. Oh my goodness, Alex. Oh, we can fit one. Well, I'm tired. I couldn't do any work today, am I? I'll just, just fit another one in. We have tea. We have drama. We have more tea. 208. In my dream, I lay next to the same kid who had haunted my sleep since the nectar had entered my veins. His bony body was strapped to an operating table, a splinter of shadow compared with my own muscled form as I lay beside him. I thought at first that the room we were in was empty, but then the darkness started to move and I realised there were wheezers all around us, their twitching limbs like insects running up and down the dark walls. It's time, said the kid, the one I knew had once been me. His face was calm, but beneath his tattered overalls I could see his ribs jutting up like rock through snow, rising and falling too fast. He was scared, and even in the fog of sleep it angered me. Time for what? I asked, my growl so deep it made the table beneath me tremble. Time to let go of me forever, the kid answered, and I could see that he was trying to hold back the tears. If that's what you want. Before I could answer, the wheezers were approaching, their staggered movements making them look like puppets. Several grabbed hold of the kid's arms and legs, but none tried to twist his gaze away from mine. I don't want to be you any more, I answered as another wheezer lifted a scalpel from a tray beside the table. You're weak, you're pathetic, you're wrong, the boy answered, and at last the fear broke through his paralysis and he started to struggle. The rest of his words came in short, short, sharp bursts as he fought the arms that held him. It's an illusion. I wasn't strong, but at least I could think for myself. You're the weak one. You're letting them win. You can still stop them. I looked at his limbs, nothing more than matchsticks, the whites of his eyes so bright they seemed to light up the entire room. The thought that he was still in my head somewhere, still alive after everything they'd done to me, made my stomach churn. He had no right to be there. I was done with him. Please, Alex, he pleaded. I don't want to die. The wheezer lowered its scalpel towards the boy's chest and held it above his heart. Then it raised its piggy eyes to me and I nodded. You died a long time ago, I said, watching as the scalpel blade vanished into the boy's skin, a geezer of blood reaching skyward like one last bid for freedom. The kid screamed, and as much as I wanted to see him die, I couldn't bring myself to watch. I turned away, losing myself in the artificial night of the ceiling until the last 
wet breath had faded. There was a shuffle of feet as the wheezers approached me, and I offered no resistance when the butcher pressed his dripping scalpel against my chest. There was pain, but pain was nothing new to me, and I didn't so much as flinch as the blade cut through my skin. Because it was a dream, there were no bones beneath, just a hole stuffed with straw and, and twigs, almost like a bird's nest. The wheezer laid the boy's heart down in its new home, the organ still pumping, despite the fact it wasn't connected to anything. Am I done? I asked, watching another wheezer thread some surgical wire through a hooked needle and start to sew me back up. They didn't respond in words, but I could see from their gleaming obsidian eyes that their work was finished. The last stitch was knotted, and they stepped back. I looked around at the kid, sprawled on the table, his dead eyes seeming to stare at the world a mile or so above him. There was no room in this world for a boy like him, like the one I had once been. There was only space for the creature that had been born from him. I lifted an arm and felt the tight zigzag of stitches that marked my chest. The kid had been killed so that I could live. His heart was now mine. I was finally complete finally whole. But even in my dream, I couldn't shake the feeling that, despite the immense layers of muscle that bound me, and the stolen heart that ground against my sternum, I was now empty inside. There was a moment when the world of my dream and that of real life seemed to overlap. I felt myself stirring, saw the wheezers peel away as I bubbled to the surface of sleep. I looked back at the body of the kid one last time, but after a single blink, the murdered boy had become a stone wall and the last trace of nightmare drained from my head. I tried to move, but it felt as though I'd been stabbed in the chest. Looking down, I saw that the truth wasn't far off. My entire torso had swollen to twice its normal size, a network of scars and stitches decorating the bruised skin. My face, too, radiated pain, and all I could do was open my mouth and utter a scream, a pathetic croak that barely made it out of my mouth before tumbling unheard to the floor. Panic gripped me, doubling the agony in my chest and stomach. I had never felt this weak, not ever. Even if I wasn't held down by the other straps, I doubted whether I could have climbed off the operating table. I was as helpless as a newborn baby, ready to be picked off by the first enemy that walked in through the door. What if something had gone wrong? What if the wheezers had somehow injured my spine as I lay sleeping? What would happen to me now? I'd be left out as bait for the rats, or maybe just incinerated, along with the rest of the failures. Something moved behind me, the flap of a coat and the tail end of a dry wheeze. Oh, Jesus, they were coming already. Wait, I tried to say, but this time my words were so timid even I didn't hear them. The noise grew louder. Then I felt the sting of a needle as it slid into my arm. Almost instantly, the pain began to fade, the strength returning to my new body as the nectar filled me. The relief was so great I swore I could hear thunder in my head, loud enough to drown out the warden until he was standing right next to me. The pain is what kills most people, he said, perching on the edge of the steel table. Oh, what drives them insane! Take the rats! They couldn't handle the pain, so they lost their minds, became animals. The nectar and the operations, they can have that effect. He noticed a trickle of blood that was slowly winding its way towards him. Pushing himself up, he paced around the room as he continued. I was worried about your mind. You see, if you try to resist too much, it's like using a stick to barricade a door. It will only last so long before it snaps into splinters. He walked over, pressed a hand on my forehead. The touch released a fresh wave of pain that scoured its way down my face and torso. But you seem to have survived with all your mental faculties intact. Well, the ones we wanted to keep anyway. You dreamed again while they operated on you, right? I was in too much pain to nod, but the warden didn't seem to be expecting an answer. It will be the last one. It always is. From now on there will be no more pain, no more nightmares, only power. It hasn't been an easy journey, I know that, but it will be 
a rewarding one. He walked around behind my head and I felt the topmost strap loosen. He appeared on my other side and unfastened the buckle that held my arm. Slowly and methodically, he released the bonds that held me, then offered me his hand. I couldn't look him in the eyes to see what his motives were, but I knew he meant me no harm. Grimacing against the ache in my chest, I took his hand and let let him pull me into a sitting position. I'm proud of you, he said, resting both palms on my head the way a Uh, the way a priest might do. You have embraced a new life. Our life. I felt my chest swell, not with pain this time, but with pride. The warden took a step back, checking the sack of nectar that hung from a stand beside the table. When he spoke again, the warmth was gone from his voice, taking me by surprise. But we are not ready to accept you. Not quite yet. I opened my mouth to protest, but he stole the words with a single glance. Simply staying alive this long isn't a guarantee that you are ready. Some of those who make it through the procedure are still weak at their core. They do not have what it takes to join my family. He nodded at the door and a wheezer entered the operating room. I watched the creature as it staggered to a tray beside the table and picked up a long syringe. This one was full of clear liquid. Some lack the physical strength to make it as one of my soldiers, the the warden went on as the wheezer tapped the tube and squirted some of the liquid into the air. Others cannot handle the responsibilities that their new life entails. The wheezer shrieked, and before I could object, it jabbed the needle into a vein in my forearm. There was none of the cold rush of nectar, just a pleasant buzz that permeated my entire body. When the warden's voice came again, it was muffled, as if heard through gauze. This is a mild anaesthetic, nothing to be worried about. When you next wake, we'll find out how far you've come, and how strong you really are. His voice continued to fade as I plunged deeper into the silence of my mind. Get the chamber ready, divert the river, and prepare the rats. Let the test begin. (sighs) Uh, We're coming up to two of my favourite chapters in the book. Um, The next one is called The Test. And the one after that was so hard to write. Um... I'd completely forgotten about it, and it's uh, it's quite horrible. Um, I don't know what's wrong with me, but then again, I don't know. Maybe us writers are evil people. I say this all the time. Writers are the most evil people you will ever meet. Just look at this face, evil. Um, yeah. Hope you have a lovely day. I um, do you know if it was up to me, I would just sit here and read all day. Uh, I would literally just read a book a day, and we'd get through like my whole collection. Um, but. Uh, sadly, I have other responsibilities, including children and including writing some new books and various bits and pieces like that. And, and of course, emailing you guys back from and messaging you back and answering your comments, which I've been so slow at doing. And I do apologize. I will get around to it. Um, I love hearing from you, though. So don't stop messaging me and writing to me and commenting because it's really, really lovely. Uh, I will be back tomorrow for um in the next two chapters maybe three i don't know probably two probably two um but maybe three uh but maybe two i don't know three two one maybe four oh, let's go wild anyway i'll stop talking now i'll uh, see you tomorrow bye <laughs>